praise the name of Jesus, the Christ, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And once again, we're at Paradise Now Church midweek teaching, and we're going to be reading out of the writings of James today, chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 5. which says, Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonoured the poor man. Do not... Do not... um, the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you are, if you really fulfil the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Who, I should say, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What does it profit? My brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Well, a lot of of dispute um, over the years about faith and works and saved by grace, saved by faith, saved by grace through faith. Um, don't judge and God is merciful. So today we're going to be looking at mercy and judgment and verse 13 says, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment and we know that God was very merciful, wouldn't he? And God is so merciful to us, and I know he is to me, and has been to me. And therefore, we need to let that mercy come through us, don't we? We need to be merciful. And... Uh, I've always learnt that there, there, there's a principle behind mercy, you know. 
every time I've, I've seen mercy in my life, there's a principle there. God is, God is doing something. Um, God wants to give opportunity. Mercy is an opportunity. Um, judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Hey? Uh, judgment will come without any opportunity to escape. For those who have shown no mercy to others, mercy triumphs over judgment. Messiah loves to be merciful, but he also is judge, isn't he? And uh, Paul the Apostle knew this and forever made it known. 2 Corinthians, um, 2 Corinthians 5.11 is a, an example of that. Where Paul says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God. And also trust are well known in your conscience. Hey? So... Paul's talking about the terror. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, they're persuading men to, uh, to go the Lord's way and uh, allowing the love of Christ to, to, to lead us and compel us in our judgments. Um, in our knowledge, understanding. So, James is uh, talking the about the two, you know, extremes here: judgment and mercy. And God is the only one that has the the power and the right to acquit anyone of any sin. We know that Esau, uh, the Lord looked at him and uh, considered him uh, profane, didn't he? In the writings of uh, Hebrews, if my memory serves me well. Um, I think it was Hebrews 13. Uh, I think it was Hebrews 13 or Hebrews 12. Um, where Esau was uh, shedding the tears and then the Lord explained you know, explained to Esau that it wasn't, that he wasn't cutting the mustard. He, he, he didn't accept that, did he? God, God was not merciful. God was not merciful to, uh, to Esau. Hebrews 12 and uh, the verses... 16, um, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance though he sought it diligently with tears. So we see that God is the final, gives the final word, didn't he? 
whereas humans would um, humans they see someone crying or weeping uh, and we automatically start to think that, uh, that this person is truly repentant and a lot of the time it, it's just that they've been caught out and that we know that there's great loss. You know, these people realise, oh, there's great loss coming for me. And it's not really godly sorrow, is it? And godly sorrow led it to repentance, not to be regretted. So the truth can be uh, a real terror. Especially if we're on, you know, always on the run from the truth. Um, going into hiding, maybe. Making excuses. Twisting the scriptures. So we can gain the approval of men and women. Uh, find favour in the media, maybe, or watering down the word or just like Esau uh, exchanging a morsel a morsel of food eh? for his birthright that's a great insult isn't it Uh, no, no better than those who exchange their position in Christ today for sin and um, then uh, find out later on it's not worth it. We know many will come on that day and say, Lord, Lord, scary words indeed, when the Lord says, go away from me. They did do a lot of different things in his name. Um, mercy is a wonderful virtue to behold, as we see here in James, and the Lord uh, the Lord tells us in other verses, blessed is the merciful, blessed is. Those who are merciful. There's a, a, it's a loving virtue, isn't it? Attribute. Loving, very loving. But it must be administered correctly. Like the whole Word of God. We must administer the Word of God uh, as the Lord would have it, by the leading of the Spirit. That's why we, well, another reason why we have the Holy Spirit, not just power. The Lord didn't give us Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, just so we have power to overcome sin, but also to um, know the truth and to be able to administer the um, Word of God appropriately. So, let me say today, our message today, mercy and judgment. Um, making a distinction uh, to what's to be um, distributed I wrote a book once uh, back in 95, 1995, Justice, Mercy and Humility, knowing that uh, what's required of us to do justly, to show mercy and to be humble. When we put those three together, um, it's pretty powerful stuff, isn't it? That's a good ministry and ministering. 
when we minister um, justly and we're merciful and humble about it, very powerful, um, James says it in the same chapter we're looking at. Uh, that we're not to administer with partiality. In James 2 9. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as sinners, as transgressors. So we know there's no partiality with mercy, don't we? And there's no partiality with judgment. There's no partiality with God um, when it comes to dealing with sin. And uh, when it comes to um, dealing with people, I think that's a just thing. I think that is um, the the fair fairness of God, and um, we must be stayed in the faith. We must be immovable in the faith and not being tossed to and fro. Uh, like unlearned people, as it says in uh, Ephesians. If we go over to Ephesians. Um, Ephesians. Go to Ephesians. Ephesians. Um, Chapter 4, and uh, 14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by trickery of men, and the cunning craftiness by which they lie and wait to deceive. But, speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head. So um, steadfast in, in the faith, though, not being tossed to and fro, grown up, matured in the word, without partiality and uh, showing mercy where mercy is needed and where the Lord would have it. Um, as I said earlier, that mercy is opportunity. God was very merciful to me in asking me to repent and or commanding and telling me to repent. Otherwise, he said if, if to me, and everyone, if you don't repent, you're going to perish. So that's when the judgment comes in, didn't it? Working together. If you don't repent... Uh, you're going to perish. You're just going to fall to pieces. Everything will fall to pieces. This is why we need the faith. We need the doctrine. This is why we need his way and we need Jesus. So everything doesn't fall to pieces. Everything doesn't turn pressure and it just spins out of control. Human beings are not big enough to, to handle life, I can tell you that now. Because the devil himself put the whole world into a spin. Back in the Garden of Eden. There's an example of um, a couple of people on the run. Right? <laughs> right? The truth becoming a terror. And they w w ended up on the run. When we're on the run from the truth, 
the truth becomes the terror. And we start to say, it always comes out of the mouth, don't judge, don't judge. When the truth comes forward, don't judge. But when the truth comes forward, it's always the siren goes off saying, it's opportunity. Opportunity knocks again. <laughs> you can repent. God's mercy is being shown to you. You know there's no mercy at the judgment seat of Jesus? There's, there will be no mercy there at the judgment seat. Right? It's just going to be full on judgment. And now we have the time to sort it out now, get it all right now with the judge. That's Jesus, he's the judge. So when you see people in the world, they go to court and they're not dressed properly, you know, like just shabby and they roll up and they're rude. The, the judge doesn't show them mercy. He slams them, he throws the book at them because they have no respect for the judge. Anyway, justice, mercy and humility. Um, we must judge righteous judgment. Must judge righteous judgment. And, and and bring forth a judgment that's going to bring liberty to the hearer and to the guilty and those who are needing opportunity to escape their sin. Um, it's a perfect solution uh, to all all dilemmas, to be stayed in the faith and led by the Spirit up to the light we have. Perfect um, position. Stayed in the faith, solid in the Word and led by the Spirit up to the knowledge or light we have. But... Um, Mercy triumphing over judgment, that uh, quote, that's not an open door um, uh, to sin. <laughs> that um, uh, it doesn't. Um, give us opportunity to to uh, just do what we want. Uh, we can't just do as we please. We, we, we really... If we go to John 15 too, have a look there for a minute. John 15. And... John chapter 15, Luke, John, and chapter 15, uh, verse 2. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You see the mercy there? Hey, mercy to those who are bearing fruit. But to those who don't bear fruit, he takes the branch away. Um, um, hell is not a place where where, where we uh, where, where we come and go. Right? Hell. There's no way out of hell. <laughs> Once we go in, that's it. 
as we read, every branch in me that does not bear fruit. You see, that's an insult to the Lord. The branch is in him and it's not bearing fruit. Now, if the branch was not in Jesus and it didn't bear fruit, he would be a hard task master, expected to bear fruit, but the branch was in him. And there are branches in Jesus that don't bear fruit and they're cast out. Any, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, that it may bear more fruit. And then we get a double emphasis on this and, and, and it just smashes the Baptist theory to pieces that, oh no, these people really didn't know Jesus because verse three just explains it all. You are already clean. How's that? You are already clean. Not because they're religious or they're Roman Catholic or the Pope's um, cousin. <laughs> they weren't clean because they were Mother Teresa's um, nieces and nephews, uh, cousins, 32nd removed. It says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Hey? What do you think of that? You are already clean. The word is a real um, stain remover and a real cleanser. <laughs> You're already clean because... Now, so we've got people that uh, are considered as branches in him and they're clean. And then he says in verse 4, if you stay in me, abide in me, abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. It means to stay and live there. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not stay in me or abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. You see the opportunity here? You see the mercy of God? God is so merciful. He, he will graft us in. If we repent... And, 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 and turn to the Lord and say, I'm going to follow you, Lord. And he grafts us into uh, the true vine. And then we start drinking the true wine from the true vine. And then we start to bear fruit and we stay there. We're not in, out, in, out, in, out. Hey? So... Um, mercy triumphs over judgment. Hey? Mercy triumphs over judgment. Isn't it wonderful and best to just do what the Lord says? Because he, he, Jesus' word is a word of mercy. You know, you look at all the scriptures. You look, you have a decent look at, um, you know, what Jesus done. We come and died on the cross and was treated very badly for us. How merciful is he? If you sin, you have an advocate. Huh? His name is Jesus. And if you repent, you'll be forgiven. And if you need wisdom, oh, just ask. And, um, you know, give and it will be given back to you. Uh, press down, shake the get over, find good measure, 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 that will be measured back. And... Uh, 
love your neighbour as you love yourself, then, then you can do well. If you really fulfil the royal law, according to the scripture, you will love your neighbour as you love yourself. James 2, 8. Hey? And... Uh, Looking after, uh, not unlike the rich, I should say, oppressing people uh, and and dragging them into court for money or whatever. Um, but uh, being merciful to the poor and. Uh, if you have a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, it's not much good saying, oh, you know, God bless. Naked and destitute. Look, you know, people have their different ideas of what poor is. <laughs> but I like the Bible. Uh, I like the Bible definition of all things. And the Bible definition of poor is naked and destitute. How many people do you know that are naked and destitute? But there's a lot of people crying poor mouth in there. Um, our faith is not worth much. We see a person with no clothes on and, and no shelter, no food. But, uh, yeah, mercy and judgment. We see that the Lord was so merciful to blind Bartimaeus, wasn't he? What do you, what do you want, Bartimaeus? <laughs> I mean, how humble, uh, how merciful. God Almighty, the, the, you know, the King of Kings and the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, asking a blind man, a beggar, are you all right? <laughs> Can I help you? <laughs> oh, that I may see. He didn't say that I'd be rich and that I'd be famous or anything. He just said, oh, that I may see. And the Lord said, okay, there you go, there's your sight. And he, he could see. Jesus, Jesus will show us anything and all things that we need along the road. If we'll ask, if we'll believe, we'll take faith. We can be assured he's merciful, but he's not a doormat and he's not a fool. James, um, James is very clear, wasn't he? Uh, he when he said that um, uh, God is not mocked. Was it James? I think that was in. Hebrews, wasn't it? Paul, do you not know that uh, without holiness you won't see God? Yeah, Paul speaking to the Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews, um, yeah. When Paul was speaking to the Hebrews, he said, without holiness you won't see God. And then we also read that God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man uh, sows or a woman, they shall reap. That doesn't sound very merciful, does it? Sounds unfair. Sounds unfair that, I, uh, oh, you know, that I would reap what I sowed. But um, that's God's way. That's God's mercy. 
you're going to sow good seed, you're going to have a great harvest, don't you? If we sow good seed. If we don't sow good seed, we're going to have a bad harvest. And God can't be merciful to that one who sows bad seed. He has to be just. Hey? The Lord has to be just. And John the Baptist was just, wasn't he? John the Baptist was just and uh, and he ended up losing his head when when he uh, brought forth the justice of the Lord and, and, and spoke about Herodian and then He lost his head, so he was being merciful, John the Baptist. He said, you can't do that. You, you, you can't take that uh, woman. But look what happened. Look, look, look how things turned down. It wasn't a good look, was it? So our message today, mercy and judgment, um, both have to be uh, applied uh, as the Lord would have it. Uh, we know that we can't just run around the place playing God. I'm going to let this one off the hook and I'm going to let that one off the hook. No. Uh, what, what, the Lord basically says that what's good for the goose is good for the gander. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't change. It doesn't change because of certain people. The Word of God stays the same. And, and as we go along, we have, to, uh, we have to grow in the Lord and we have to uh, rearrange things for the Lord and we have to... Um, uh, do things with our partiality and we need to walk by faith. And that's how we show our faith, don't we? By the way we, we operate and our concept. Our concept. Um, let's just go over to Galatians for a minute. Um, that's how we show our faith. Uh, yeah. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a man that it be or woman sows, that they will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. See that? So, there's that sowing that good and bad seed. And I had a basic principle for my children as they grew up. Uh, from grade one forward, I'd, I'd tell them a simple little, uh, I'd give them a simple word every morning, every single morning. My son is now 19 and my daughter's 15. And I'd say, we've got another day today, and a lovely day. Now we're going to sow seed today. If you're going to sow good seed, you're going to be blessed. You're going to have a good harvest. If you sow bad seed, you're not going to be blessed and you're going to have a bad harvest and you're going to be very unhappy. What sort of seed do you want to sow today? And we've done that year after year after year after year. And it's so simple, isn't it?
the principle of God sowing and reaping, mercy and judgment is our message today. And I want, I want the God, uh, I, I want uh, the mercy of God. I don't want the judgment of God. That's why we go out there, isn't it, today and every other day. And we tell the people, you know, God can um, be merciful to you uh, today or he can judge you. Damned. God, God doesn't want to judge us damned. He wants to be merciful to us. He wants us to receive, take opportunity, take advantage of his mercy, repent, turn to him, do what he says. And then on judgment day, he judges us worthy and acceptable. And many are going to come on that day and say, Lord, Lord, we've done this and that, but we didn't do what you said. <laughs> we didn't abide in the vine. We didn't bear the characteristic fruits of Christ. Um, mercy does triumph. Mercy does triumph over judgment. And uh, it's preferred by God and preferred by every true minister. Every true minister endeavours to be merciful to the congregation and they, those who, who they're dealing with. And, you know, sometimes uh, that doesn't just doesn't get through. So judgment comes, doesn't it? And, you know, even then, judgment is good too because, if, you know, if we accept the judgment then, see, he, he offers his mercy, then he offers his judgment. And if we accept the judgment, we don't accept the mercy. And then we accept the judgment and realise, well, and, and we act accordingly, we won't be judged on the judgment day as damned knowing the terror of the Lord, Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord. We persuade men and women to go the way of the Lord. So uh, God gives us all adequate time, doesn't he? And for us to make a firm, definite decision and, and action to depart from their known sin, but uh, if we don't act um, after God re repetitively telling us, what can we expect other than judgment? Right? God's preference is mercy, but judgment will come. And we don't know what, sometimes what form that will come in with the Lord because he, he is sovereign and he does things um, unlike we do and unlike we expect. <laughs> Mercy is given that we escape the horrifying consequences, isn't it? That's why... God shows us mercy because he loves us. Hey? That's why dad is merciful to the children, his son or daughter, and he put up with it for so long and that's it then. And then there's the straw that breaks the camel's back. And then discipline has to come. So we can go along so so far and and then we have to do a crash halt and say, right, we've got to deal with this now. It has to be dealt with. And uh, if we are without chastening, well, we're just bastards, aren't we? So whatever way we try to uh, escape or whatever, whatever way we look at it, um, there'll always be mercy and judgment. We can't escape that. And uh, 
God uh, his chastening shows us that he loves us because he's, he's disciplining us he's trying to turn us in another direction and because uh, the direction we're heading is he- towards hell you know a lot of people are taught that all all churchgoers and church leaders even the so-called TV evangel, television evangelist and so-called um, schools of prophets and everything, that these people won't go to the great white throne judgment. But, you know, my question is, where else can a sinner go? I mean, you know? People sort of seem to think that a a churched sinner is different to a sinner. But the scriptures don't say that. I don't see it anyway. Maybe someone can explain it to me. But I don't see it. Um, A sinner is a sinner. You got that once saved, always saved teaching going around it. It, 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 it's made people so self-important and selfish and oh, Jesus doing it all for me as if you're someone. Who the hell do you think you are? <laughs> oh, Jesus is doing it all for me. Uh, you know, he's going to walk me, walk for me, piggyback me and, you know, they show this little lamb on the shoulder of a bearded man they say that's Jesus carrying you. When you you know you don't feel like walking, that's Jesus carrying you after you've just sinned, or whatever. All this religious stuff, you know, that's not in the scriptures. You know. Also, I do believe that Jesus uh, is merciful and nurses the 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 genuinely weak and broken. I believe that at the same time. But I don't believe in this piggybacking to heaven, you know. Jesus is going to piggyback you. Once saved, always saved. Well, it was about 18 years ago I said, I believe. Oh, you believe? Yep, I sure do. I mean, I'm going on in my sin, but I believe. If you really believe, would you be going on in your known sin? Huh? If you really believe. You know, God, uh, God's mercy is shown at the tree. Uh, that he gave up the ghost and said, all is accomplished and it's finished. And he made himself a propitiation for our sin. And he paid the prize and... and uh, shed his blood and bought us, paid the price, bought us. We're, we're not our own. We belong to him. We, we can't just go on nilly-willy our own way doing what we want to do. And, and oh, I like this and I don't like that. And God understands. You know, Jesus understands I like me sin. <laughs> Jesus understands I like this kind of sin and it's okay. God is merciful. Is that the way it is? No, it's not like that at all. We we know what it's like, even if we don't know what it's like. Let's read the scriptures. Let's read the scriptures and see what it is like. Huh? Hebrews ten twenty six. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour, devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he or she be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Can of the blood of the covenant 
a common thing in cell of the spirit of grace. Eh? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will pay, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hey? Eh? You wonder why the preacher jumps up and down and yells. Huh? When you read scripture like that, doesn't that rattle you? Doesn't that sound the warning bells? Doesn't it say, hey, uh, do my congregation know this? Don't, doesn't that say to you, you know, I'm accountable to, to tell my congregation what the Lord said here in Hebrews 10.26 to, uh, what is it, 30, 31. Huh? A lot of churches don't want to read that. I, I, I honestly believe there's churches in the world that have never read that to the congregation or expounded upon it. I really do. They either haven't read it at all or they've read it and they haven't expounded upon it. Therefore, the people don't even have a clue what it means. I guarantee you the Roman Catholic Church have never expounded upon that. Right. You know what I see in those verses? Uh, what I see in, in, in Hebrews 10, 26 to 31, I see mercy and judgment. I, I see God's mercy and judgment. Firstly, I see God's mercy because he would write it and put it on paper and, and keep it in perfect tact. He keep that so that we'd be aware, <laughs> so we'd know this is what's going to happen. Hey, now if it wasn't applicable, what's it doing there? If it was Old Testament, and why isn't it in the Old Testament and left there? No, it's applicable. It applies to the saints of today and the disciples of today. It's not just garbage. Once saved, always saved. Teddy Bear's Picnic, God understands and no one's perfect and, and you can't be holy because there's only one who's holy and that's Jesus. <laughs> oh, you know, you might think that's exalting him, that he's the only holy one. Now, I tell you what, if you have a Holy Spirit, not just dwelling in you but leading you, well, don't you think you'd be holy? If if you uh, are led by a spirit that only promotes and, and upholds the teaching of Jesus and you're doing what Jesus says, do you think you'd be holy? Huh? Do you think you could call yourself a saint if you did what Jesus said? Of course you could. Because that's what a saint is. A saint is someone who does what Jesus says. Because when you do what Jesus says, you're a standout. You're not just some common trash. You're not some trailer trash. You're a standout. You're, you're, you're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're, 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 you're a peculiar person. When you do what Jesus says, you become strange looking <laughs> to the world. You don't think, oh dear, what does that man do? He doesn't do anything. You know, that's why you hear people say, oh, you know, I'm not ready. I've got too much to do in the world. I, I want my own life. I've got my own life to live. I want to do this and I want to do that. I, th I didn't know that you could call the shots. As I know, you were bought, weren't you? You were born again and a bought one. Bought with the blood of the lamb. You you're no longer your own. You do not call the shots. Jesus calls a shot. He is your master, saviour, redeemer, God. No, nah, we don't want to hear that. The people don't want to hear that. Hey? 
so uh, mercy is given that we may escape the horrifying consequences. Now, if we don't lay hold of it, what shall be the end? Hebrews um, chapter 3 is another goody too, where it says, in Hebrews 3, 12, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of the Christ if we hold the beginning of our, of our confidence, or you could say faith, Steadfast to the end. See? In departing from the living God. Well, when you depart from the living God, you know what happens? You become lost again. Oh, you can't, you, you can't become lost again. You can't, you, you, you can't lose your salvation. <laughs> you know, if you're lost, you're not saved. <laughs> when you depart from the light, you're in darkness. When you depart from God is light, God is love, God is judgment, God is mercy, God is shepherd. Hey? God is it's uh, helper. So when you depart from the living God, you've departed from all that. You're just a lost soul. It's, it's in, it, sin will harden and harden and harden. They got that crusty uh, heart and the conscience seared with the hot irons of hell. Hey? Crusty demons. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. So you, you, you don't believe anymore. I don't believe, you know. I, why does God do this and why does God do that? You know, if 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 God is this and if God is that, that's unbelief. That's evil. How dare, how dare you say that? In departing, evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And then it talks about being hardened through sin. Sin is very deceitful. Sin tells us that we won't be hardened. Sin tells us that um, everything's going to be okay, just enjoy yourself. Because sin is deceitful. See? So when you depart from the living God, you're in the darkness. You're no longer in the light. You don't know where you're going. You are lost with a big L. You are lost. You are the biggest loser. <laughs> That's for sure. Eh? You're the biggest loser. When we depart from the living God because of unbelief, Oh, look what's happening in the world. Look at this and look at that. Now, we have to hold fast. We have to uh, um, if we hold the beginning for there, verse 14, for we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning, otherwise you're not a partaker of Christ. You've partaken of another Jesus, really, aren't you? If we hold the beginning of our faith, our confidence, steadfast to the end, you see? Holding the faith. Steadfast to the end. Not for a little spell, not for a little while, but... To the end, to the very end. See, can it possibly be once saved, always saved? Look, I'll just drive this nail home till the day I die. It's a devil's doctrine. Once saved, always saved 
is a neglect of uh, the great salvation, Hebrews 2, 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? That's what once saved, always saved. It's neglect. It's neglect. It's nothing else but neglect. It, 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 it's self-indulgence. It's actually, as I've said before, it's the true, the bona fide self-lordship that you're still Lord. Jesus isn't Lord. They, they try to bung it on, these devil children of the devil in these churches, saying that, oh, you, you know, you're, you're into self-lordship because you obey and you promote obedience and without obedience you, you'll be damned. They say that's self-lordship. No, true bona fide self-lordship is you going on in your sin. That's self-lordship. Because Jesus ain't Lord. Because if Jesus is Lord, you'd be doing what he says. And if you do what he says, you won't be going on in your own sin. Can someone say amen? Hallelujah. Huh? How twisted, how, how ignorant and how uh, deluded to accept absolute predestination, salvation by election. That rotten, stinking Spurgeonism, that Spurgeonite doctrine, the Spurgeon there with his pipe in his mouth or his cigar or whatever he poisoned his body with and claimed holiness. Hey? Once saved, always saved. God's going to get you there. God's going to piggyback you there. God's going to walk your walk for you, isn't he? Is that, what it, is that what the scriptures say? No, the scriptures say you sort out your own salvation, not the pastor. The pastor doesn't sort out your salvation. You sort out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Haven't you got an interest in your own soul's destination? Well, you better start sorting it out. You don't expect the pastor. Oh, Dad, sort out my salvation with fear and trembling for me, will you? Oh, Mum, sort out my salvation with fear and trembling for me, will you? No, 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 no. You sort out your own salvation with fear and trembling before the Lord. Does that sound like one saved, always saved? Huh? Hey? No, that's not mercy and, and judgment. That's just mercy, mercy, mercy. Even though you don't uh, take the opportunity to repent, you still expect mercy. That's rubbish. It doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. So, um, if, if the sinner goes to the great white throne judgment, how much more the traitor? Where do you think a traitor would go? Do you think a traitor would go to the uh, judgment stand of the saints? No. A traitor is actually worse than a sinner. Right? They deserve greater judgment than those, as we read in Hebrews, they deserve greater judgment than those who... Um, broke the law of Moses, uh, who rejected the law of Moses, they died without mercy, without mercy, on the testimony of two or three bona fide witnesses, died without mercy. What do you think of that? Now the Lord turns around, you say, oh, well, that's the law, you know, and we're not under law, and is that well? Forget that verse twenty-eight, uh, Hebrews ten, and look at twenty-nine. How much more? How much worse punishment do you suppose? You you think about it. 
How much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? He was sanctified. Now you think about that. This one was sanctified. He trampled the blood underfoot. He was sanctified. Oh, one saved always, sir. Trample the blood of the covenant of which he was sanctified, a common thing, and insulted the Holy Spirit. Huh? What do you think about that? Mercy and judgment. Mercy and judgment. You know... I reckon Romans, um, if we go over to Romans, I reckon this will complement what I'm saying here. And um, let's let's go over to Romans chapter 11 and see what it says. Another mercy and, and judgment. Um, scriptures Romans 11 the verses 20 Um, let's read 19 start in 19 Romans 11 19 You, um, you will say then branches were broken off that I might be grafted in well said because of unbelief they were broken off and you stand by faith do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, but toward you goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And if they also, or should say, and they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again if they don't continue in unbelief. But if they continue in unbelief, they're good as damned, aren't they? And he said the same goes for us, the Gentiles. If we continue in his goodness, everything will be good. You see the mercy? But if we don't, you see the judgment the severity of God, you'll be cut off. And when you're cut off, you run around like a chalk with its head cut off. Have a look at the Jews. They run around like chooks with their head cut off. They've got no idea of who Messiah is. They've got no idea of the bona fide truth. I'm telling you. Do I hate Jews? I love Jews. I love Jews. I love Africans. I love Filipinos. I love Samoan, Tongans, you know, Germans. (laughs) You know what I mean? Nazis or whatever you want to call them. Uh, Arabs. Doesn't mean I go their way and accept what they say and do what they do. As the Lord would love them, he wants to save them. He wants to be merciful to them. He doesn't want to have to judge them damned. When God judges, we're seen as righteous or unrighteous. Now, if we've departed from God, how can we be part of God? If we've departed from God, Huh? How can we be part of God? As we read in uh, in Hebrews, as we read in, in Hebrews 3, 12, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But then it says in verse 14, For we have become 
part of Christ, partakers of Christ. Right? So you've got part of and then you've got departing. Twelve is departing. Fourteen is part of. Only if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. You know what the beginning was like? It was hallelujah time, wasn't it? The beginning of the walk with Jesus, oh, it's honeymoon material. See, we've got to keep the honeymoon uh, rolling. Hey? Like honey in the rock, like honey in the rock, my Jesus is just like honey in the rock. Hey? Like honey in the rock. We've got to keep the honeymoon going. As the scripture says, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, if we're going to depart, we're not part with him. we got no part with Jesus if we depart. So, a message today, mercy and judgment. Hey? Mercy and judgment. I hope everyone that listening that is uh, listening to this message today, I hope they choose uh, mercy. I, I hope everyone chooses to um, repent and and believe uh, the Lord and repent and um, receive every word, judgment, righteousness, and loving kindness of God, and abide there and continue to the very end that they may be saved. For he who endures to the end shall be saved. And everyone said, Amen and Amen and Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Lord.